So now, a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Fabian, because I didn't tell you. Um, so I'm going to talk about storing 16 bytes at scale. Um, if you've looked at the schedule, you realize that this is sort of like starting off the core rest track. Um, and that's just because Core S does a bunch of work on Prometheus upstream, uh, and after a short, short break, uh, we are now hiring people again. So if you're interested in actually working on Prometheus upstream and also integrating Prometheus with Kubernetes and also Tectonic, of course, um, just visit our careers page uh, and apply. So with that out of the way, um, let's start. Um, so we try to store 16 bytes at scale. Um, why do we try that? Um, we want to store time series, and time series happen to be composed out of samples. And samples are just like streams of values, and each value has a timestamp attached. And that's basically it. Pretty simple problem. Um, just that we don't have a single time series, but a lot of time series. Um, and to do this now, we somehow have to also sort of determine like what is a time series, right? We need a way to address a single series or a set of series. And in Prometheus, you probably know the data model. Um, we have metric names. These are meant to sort of give a semantic meaning to the values that are in your time series. And then you can sort of fan out or split up this metric um, using labels. So a metric name plus um, a set of labels and a unique set of values for these labels is a single time series. Uh, and this allows them to sort of partition this metric space and gain insight along different dimensions. And to now select or query different time series, um, you can just select the metric name, which gets you all the time series that have this metric name, but you can also add um, label matchers like method equals get, and there are also uh, regex matchers. It's just a really powerful way to select across all these series in a multi-dimensional way. <laughs> And of course, there's a sort of second dimension to it, which is time. Um, so we have this two-dimensional plane of series in the vertical axis and time in the horizontal one. Um, and if we want to query something, we A, select series, but also we constrain these series over a certain time range. And this can be pretty much anything, right? We can just sort of query all series for the last minute or just the last sample. We can just query a single series or a set of series for the entire time range we know, um, or any rectangle on this plane, really. Um, and that's quite like a lot of degrees of freedom, right? Like we have to basically support any query pattern you can imagine on this on this plane. Um, whereas uh, actually adding data is pretty simple because we just add data um, at the rightmost side here, right? We just add um, single samples to every time series um, pretty much periodically. Um, so now we want to put a storage for this. Um, and before we start, we have to sort of figure out like what do we actually are aiming for, right? What's our order of scale? Um, when saying we want to store these 16 bytes at scale. Um, and I think a pretty good measure is um, taking like 5 million active time series, that's equivalent to about like 2,000 to 15,000 microservice instances, um, depending on how many series each exposes, and then scraping these every 30 seconds. And with one month of attention, this gives us about 166,000 samples a second. We actually have to persist to disk. Um, and in total, that's for the whole month, 40, uh, 432 billion samples. And um, a sample is a timestamp, which is 8 bytes, and a value, which is also 8 bytes. Thereby, we have to store 16 bytes at scale. Um, and if you do the math, just the raw data we have to store um, for one month is 7 terabytes. This seems pretty okay, right? Like, it's a pretty incredible fan-in factor, like 2,000, 15,000 sort of processes you can monitor with a single Prometheus server. Um, but because we are on this two-dimensional plane of series and time, as soon as we sort of tweak any of these base parameters, um, this number goes up, right? <laughs> so six months is 42 terabytes. It's also still possible, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah. And then you might add a few more targets, and this number goes up again. You might reduce the, the square meter a little bit, uh, and it just grows and grows and grows. Um, so a natural choice would be, okay, maybe you can do some sort of compression. Um, to make this a bit uh, smaller, especially because series are quite repetitive. So a lot of series do not change all that much. Like, I think the estimate is like 40 to 60% of your series are actually constant um, within like certain bounds. 
Uh, and of course, if things don't change, these are sort of um, candidates for compression. Um, and to compress samples, we start with timestamps because it's pretty much easier. Uh, we scrape every 30 seconds, and this means that these timestamps um, in the Unix presentation here um, have a pretty equal distance between each other. And if you just sort of write this down, you have the first timestamp, and then you just add 30 and 30, and there's like sort of an outlier, which is like 39, and another 30. Um, but these numbers are definitely smaller than the initial numbers, so there must be some compression potential there. Um, and of course, you can also do this on disk, right? You can like store 30 in um, less bytes on disk um, than these whole Unix timestamps. Um, but you can do even better, right? Because even these deltas don't change that much. So if you take the delta of the delta, get even smaller values. Um, and in most cases, actually, these deltas of deltas will be zero, like almost like 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, and this, of course, is like if you have some sort of repetitive value that's for almost every sample the same, you can just basically allocate a single bit for that. Um, and in the general case, we can thereby, um, with some tricks, generally store timestamps uh, in a single bit. Then there are values, and that's a bit more complicated because we basically allow you to do any float64 value, right? Um, and luckily, there was some prior research um, based on which then Facebook um, developed the compression mechanisms for their own time series database, uh, which you can find uh, read about in the link below. Uh, and it's based on taking the virtual representation of your float64 values. Um, and if you look at that, you see kind of similarities. So here we have a few decimal numbers, and you see the double representation there. And there are a lot of zeros. And like even the, um, the, the head of, the, of these numbers is pretty much the same. So if you XOR like two similar things, um, all these uh, same regions cancel out, and you get even more zeros. And the only sort of meaningful information to expect out of that is in these red boxes here. That's the actual difference. So similar to the timestamps, we just like take the first value and then sort of derive the second value based on and just storing the difference. We can also just store this um, x or difference, uh, and then just also store the number of trailing and leading zeros for each uh, sample value, um, and thereby compress these values as well. And this works pretty good uh, for decimal values as well as for um, values with fractions at the end. And in total. This gets you from a raw 16 bytes per sample to a compressed uh, average of 1.37 bytes. And that's a pretty good saving, about 12x. Um, and we realized this pretty early on, right? Um, so Prometheus 1 comes with a compression scheme, which is not quite as good. Um, but then Bjorn, after reading this paper, implemented this exact mechanism for Prometheus 1 as well. And you can sort of flip it on. And then there's Damien, who is just someone who used to work at Booking.com, and he just like implements a lot of really cool papers in Go, and is pretty good at it. Uh, and he did the same for this um, compression mechanism, but also added some assembly in between, so this is even more efficient. Uh, so we kind of like went using his library for Prometheus 2, and now the total compression sort of accounts for like 3% of our total CPU time, so we get this compression literally for free. And this turns our 7 terabytes into 0 0.8 terabytes. And it's a constant improvement, right? Um, it's not like scaling anything per se, but it's pretty important because it, it, it buys you so much. And this turns our problem of storing 16 bytes at scale into storing 1.37 bytes at scale, um, which is a smaller problem. <laughs> uh, so how did Prometheus 1 do this? Um, well, uh, you want to figure out that um, this compression is based on the previous sample all the time. So to actually get to sample n, you have to know sample n minus 1. So you can only sort of stream forward through a compressed stream of samples. And if you want to access the last sample, you don't really want to really start at the beginning of time to like read all potentially millions of samples for a series. Um, but instead, you want to sort of be able to jump at least um, somewhat in between. And that's why we have chunks. Um, and chunks are just bundling up a bunch of samples, like 100 to 1,000 maybe. Uh, and then you can jump around in a series uh, to a certain chunk and then just decompress um, this chunk to get to the value you actually care about. And in Prometheus 1, we have for each series one file. Uh, and you want to figure, like if you have five minute series, that's five million files. Uh, sounds like a lot, but like modern file systems actually can deal with this pretty well. Um, and that's why Prometheus 1 works. Uh, but you might also figure that if we sort of append new samples vertically in this in this um, graph here, 
that we would have to basically go around to every series file and add 1.37 bytes on average. Um, and that's like a few hundred thousand of times per second. Um, and of course, on spinning disks, that's not going to work at all. Um, but even on SSDs, um, if you could get this throughput, uh, you would probably like fry this SSD within like a day or two. Just because um, SSDs were out, if you just make too many random and small modifications. Um, so to avoid this, we just sort of keep the most recent chunk, which we're actually adding data to, in memory. And only once a chunk is really completed and we don't add any more data, we just flush it to disk. And even if you do this sort of batching, you're still probably flushing like a few thousand chunks per second to disk. Um, but you definitely get a much higher throughput. Um, this works all great. Um, and now sort of the enemy of Prometheus comes in for like the last year, which is uh, churn. And churn was basically brought onto things like Kubernetes. Um, just um, our environments are becoming more dynamic, right? Um, we get all these like cool things like, I don't know, uh, auto scaling and rolling deployments. Like every commit to master, you can just like roll it out in a new version to your entire cluster. Um, and you roll new pods, and each pod gets a new name. Uh, and with each uh, new name of your instance, you also get a new set of metrics. So, Metrics and uh, these time series like tend to become a lot shorter because just instances don't live as long. Um, but in return, you get more of them. Um, so now we still have five million active time series, right? We didn't like like make our infrastructure bigger at all. It's just more dynamic, and so over time we accumulate more time series in total. But the total throughput did not really change all that much. Um, but now we go from like 5 million files to 150 million files for one month. And this just grows more and more and more as we increase retention time. And of course, in the future, this will, this like dynamic sort of um, aspect of infrastructure will just be, become even more obvious. And this sort of, uh, this will just probably just become an even steeper increase, right? So that you might have like billions and billions of series for a single month. Uh, and that's sort of getting from this one as you might have sort of encountered if you're in, running in one of these environments. Um, and like one example problem here is, let's say you want to query something, just like before, we can like pick any rectangle in our two-dimensional space. Um, if you just select a bunch of series, um, you get all the series the storage has for these selectors you provided, but this does not necessarily mean anymore that there's actual data in the time window you selected, right? Because it's just like a lot more sparse than it was before. Um, and this can like become really expensive in querying when actually you have data for like 100 series, but actually querying like uh, 100,000. So, um, how can we address this? Um, I mean, one option is to just sort of store for every series which time range it covers. Um, sure, but then now you have to like sort of index intervals of series, and then you don't know all that well when a series actually stops. It's not a trivial problem, and Brian will talk about it later. Um, and then a series might actually come back again, right? Now you have to like store a list of intervals for every series and it gets like really complex to index this kind of stuff. Um, and just really annoying and just to even think about it. So um, like a simpler solution is just, okay, um, if our series grow over time, then maybe just like let's constrain the time and we divide our time dimension into these blocks. Um, and we treat each of these blocks as a single database, effectively, like its own time series database. And by bounding the time, we also bound the number of series we can have, right? It's like uh, within these blocks, roughly equivalent to the actual amount of active time series we have, maybe a factor of two. And if everything worked before, um, if you can constrain this amount of time series, then this probably is going to work as well. And of course, now if you have all these small databases, if you want to query something, um, well, yeah. We somehow have to fan out right into every block that matters for our query, uh, and then get these partial results and merge them back together. So there's certainly a cost of that. Um, but in return, whenever you run a query, you only have to pick those blocks that are actually within the range of your query itself. And thereby, without actually indexing which time ranges the series covers, um, you basically get the same properties of cutting down all the series that don't matter from a result set, at least sort of in an amortized way. Um, and of course, if you like have a long time range, um, at some point, there's just a lot of blocks, right? By default, these blocks have a time range of two hours. And if you want to query data for like one month, it's just like a lot of murdering has to happen uh, from all these different blocks. And therefore, uh, as time goes on, we take a bunch of blocks and compact them into larger blocks. 
Um, and this is quite sort of mapping well to our actual query pattern because as we query older data, the queries tend to cover longer time ranges. Whereas I might query like one minute of data um, in the last 30 minutes, it's quite unlikely that I query actually one minute uh, from nine months ago. I'm probably going to look at the big picture of, um, I don't know, last, um, last January, for example. And this block-based design also makes something incredibly easy um, because um, if we want to lead, lead out data, we just wait until the block sort of has traveled past the retention boundary and then we just like delete it. It's like one directory, um, it's basically instantaneous. And that's quite different from Prometheus Run, which had to sort of traverse all these individual series files, look into the chunks that were in there, figure out whether this chunk actually is still within our retention time, and if not, rewrite the entire file to disk. Um, and do this, and if you have series churn, right, you have to do this like for hundreds of millions of files, and this naturally um, took quite a toll. And also contributes to the fact that your SSDs are sort of fried rather quickly. Um, so I wrote a POC for that, um, but actually like a working POC. <laughs> um, and uh, because I thought it's kind of cool, I wrote this like 20 page blog post about it. <laughs> um, and it somehow made it to Hacker News, and of course people on Hacker News are a lot smaller than everybody else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, oh my god, this is so dumb, that's basically an S entry, time series must be in a V plus three. <laughs> okay, um, but it, it kind of works, right, so th th there must be something that's not totally wrong. Um, and that's because, well, it, it has quite a few properties of an S entry, right, you have these compactions going on, and you, sort of, you, you do these scatter gather queries, um, but it's not like this hierarchical pattern that you have in S entries usually, and it's, if you look at it, this is a tree, right? And if you have a B plus tree somehow, like the leaves would be chunks, right? Because you still want this compression and in the leaf you have each chunk. Now we somehow have to get to this chunk and you probably then have a tree because you want to sort of traverse it um, cheaply. Yeah, it looks like a tree. Um, pretty much like depending on how you model this whole thing as it's implemented, it's, it is a tree structure if you want to consider it this way, right? Um, so. Yeah, it's this whole uh, concept is some something between LSM and the tree, um, but it works, and that's sort of the only thing that matters really. <laughs> and compaction just is equivalent to sort of restructuring this tree a bit. So, um, so how do we actually write data to disk? Um, each of these blocks here um, has a directory. And similar to Prometheus 1, um, we don't want to write like every sample to disk like as it comes in because it's just too expensive and we have to batch stuff up. And we follow the similar model, right? Like the most recent data, we keep it in memory, but just like we keep entire blocks in memory and not just chunk-wise per series. Um, and as these blocks sort of get completed and don't receive any more data, we just write them to disk. And this happens in a custom format. So it's, there's an index file and a bunch of chunk files, um, but it's not millions of files, but just per block, something between uh, 2 and 20 files usually. And these are then, for the persisted um, data, they are just mapped, um, so we can sort of access this data uh, transparently, and the operating system will take care for us of actually caching certain frequently accessed pieces of it uh, and just evicting other stuff from memory. And this sort of saves us from all the burden of managing memory, which was quite, um, is quite hard to get right, and is like a frequent point of trouble in Prometheus 1. So, um, if you sort of paid attention, you kind of realize that I said that you can sort of pick any rectangle in this in this space uh, for your queries, and this also means that I can still query a single series or a bunch of series for the entire time range. So, while this in general allows me to cut out a lot of data for my queries, um, in an edge case, I still have to consider consider every single series that exists. So. <laughs> Theoretically speaking, like in big O notation, this not, does not really buy us anything, right? Everything is just as bad as it was. Um, which means basically we just need a better index that can actually handle uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of series. Um, so, um, so we sort of need both, um, both sides of it. And that's why we also have, in each of these databases, have a separate index um, to actually quickly find series. Um, and we borrow concepts from search engines, basically what you can find in Elastic or Google. Um, they have an inverted index, um, which basically just means if you have a document and you want to look up a document by searching for words that might appear in documents, um, you can do this efficiently, right? Without traversing every single document and like searching through it, through it um, you can just like 
do a quick lookup. And to implement this, we just give an ID to every series within a block. Um, let's say it's five. And then we consider the words of our document, um, the label pairs. So the full combination of label name and label value. And for each of these um, label pairs, we maintain a sorted list from label pair to all document IDs this label pair appears in. So now if I want to request um, all documents that have status equals 200, so all series that have this label pair, I can just walk through this list once and I get the result back, right? I don't have to traverse everything. Um, and this approach also allows us to do really, really efficient uh, K-way set operations, which is usually merging an intersection. Um, and this usually occurs, uh, for example, when you want to retrieve all series that have status equals 200 and method equals get. And to then retrieve all these series, you just put a cursor at the beginning of these two lists and always advance a cursor that has, uh, that's pointing to the smaller value. And as soon as um, the value match, we add this to our result set. So we move to two, uh, and two and two matches, right? So this is our result, and we just move on, both of them. Um, and now three is more than five, so we advance this cursor until we have a match again, and we just continue this pattern until one of these lists is exhausted. Then we're done. And that's, of course, incredibly much more efficient um, than, tr uh, than traversing the entire set of series to find certain things. And this also scales uh, beyond just like two lists, right? You can do the same for any, like any, com any number of lists. In Prometheus, this probably maxes out somewhere between like two and five. Um, but you can also do merges, et cetera, which are important for regex matchers, um, which will then in Prometheus 2.0 thereby uh, also hopefully be a lot more efficient. So, that was fast. Benchmarks. Um, Yeah, um, so benchmarks are tough, right? Um, like historically, benchmarking for us meant get a big server and just look, monitor a bunch of stuff um, and then check the numbers. Um, that's kind of cool to get like high scores, right? Like we can, it's, but it's easy to sort of bias your benchmarks in, in favor of like increasing a certain metric. Um, so we kind of decided let's let's write something that's reproducible um, that we can use co to continuously develop the new storage layer and test whether we have regressions or we're actually improving on certain dimensions. Um, and we just picked actually the source of our pain, sort of, which is Kubernetes. Um, and we are starting a cluster and um, add a bunch of dedicated Prometheus nodes where we can run one Prometheus server each uh, and can sort of A, B, C, D, E test them. And can also then compare different versions in the same environment doing the same thing. Uh, and we deploy about 800 microservice instances to it uh, and monitor these and also the cluster components themselves. And that's a bit like, or a bit below the order of scale I've shown you before. Um, but it's just more of a cost factor thing, right? Um, and this gets us to 120,000 samples per second um, over 300,000 active time series. There's a lot of fewer series that we actually sort of are shooting for, but in return, we really simulate this series, series churn very excessively. So we swap out 50% of our running applications every 10 minutes, which means every 10 minutes, our number of series in our entire database goes up by 50%. 50 and that's like a really straining and interesting scenario that's probably like 10x um, higher than you would actually encounter in the real world today. Um, but it's a good way to test like this, this model that we developed actually sort of scales into the future. So memory. Um, we have four lines here. Um, so we're running Prometheus 1.5. It's a bit of an old benchmark. Um, and Prometheus 2, and then of both versions, we are on two instances each, um, and one of each are not being queried, and the other ones are sort of retrieving, retrieving, receiving artificial querying traffic. Uh, it's not super sophisticated, but just like a pretty moderate to high load of complex queries, like literally querying up to like hundreds of thousands of series. Um, so this is quite um, quite good to compare, like what's what performance goes to ingestion and like what's what's the delta to actually also do querying against it. Um, and from top to bottom, we see Prometheus 1.5 being queried and then being unqueried. And then at the bottom, we see Prometheus 2 being queried and unqueried, respectively. Um, and we see some sort of notable savings, I would say, right? Um, Prometheus uses about like 2.5 gigabytes to actually handle this workload um, at a pretty consistent rate, right? Like it goes up in the beginning and just stays at this level. Uh, whereas Prometheus 1 sort of ramps up its memory consumption over time, and then sort of stabs out for a while, and then suddenly it bumps up again. 
Um, and that's when actually retention starts. And we actually have to maintain the series we have written to disk. We have to delete all the data, and we have to cycle through all these series basically all the time. Like whenever we reach the bottom, we go to the top again because it just takes so long. Um, and this ramps up memory usage like once more again, right? So um, I think typically memory savings for Prometheus 2 are between 2 and 5x, depending on like what the environment you're operating in. CPU, uh, same story, um, same order. Prometheus 1.5 above and Prometheus 2 below. Um, here we can see that CPU usage dropped like massively, and that's not just the storage, right? There are some optimizations that were sort of enforced by just integrating the new storage into the scraping layer. Um, but basically, for like 300,000 samples a second, no, 120,000, um, we are barely using like half a CPU core. Um, so this also made us sort of realize that we are not really bound by the number of samples you can ingest, which is a metric you usually use to sort of measure our performance in Prometheus. Um, it's really the total amount of series that matters, right? Um, we, can, we can crank up to probably one to five million samples a second, and it's just gonna cost CPU, but nothing else. Um, and actually, there's a separate TSDB benchmark just measuring like throughput through the TSDB itself without Prometheus attached. And on, on my MacBook, this can go up to like 12 million samples a second. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's not the uh, relevant metric here. But yeah, for Prometheus 1.5, we see that sort of the same pattern, right? The fiat with memory, it sort of ramps up and then bumps up quickly again as we sort of do retention. Disk writes. Um, I think not many people experience it, um, but yeah, if you have a heavy load of Prometheus server, it can fry your SSD pretty much like at, at least at two or three times the speed that usually does, right? Like after one year, you might have to swap out your disk. Um, and with the lack of backups in Prometheus 1, that's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> um, so yeah, we are like saving like 98 to 99% here. Uh, it was quite surprising, right? This was not a metric we actually looked at before or even tried to optimize for. Um, but we can see this pretty steady rate um, in Prometheus 2. Um, it's about like one megabyte continuously, which is for the writer headlock, which we use to actually ensure we don't lose any data. Um, and then you have these small spikes which are happening when we compact data, right? We just like rewrite data into larger blocks, um, which like, seems expensive, but as it turns out, it doesn't matter like at all. On disk size, um, yeah, uh, that's not fair. Um, like both are using the XR compression scheme, um, so this is already the the sort of safe spacing version or space saving version of Prometheus One. Um, sort of. I, the sample compression must be the same, right? We're using the same algorithm, so this can't be it. Um, and this is probably just like due to the overhead we have per series when we are um, storing uh, storing data in Prometheus One, um, <coughs> whereas um, the sort of custom disk format uh, in Prometheus Two is like highly optimized and highly compressed. Um, for example, all strings are completely deduplicated. Um, so, if, like, if you have like one million series, that's like gigabytes of string data. <laughs> um, but effectively, it's probably like 2,000 to 4,000 unique strings. So, just to be clear, the color schemes change, right? So the lower. Oh yeah, yeah. Then there's no, there's no version label on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the above graphs are like Prometheus one, and the lower ones are Prometheus two, um, and the Prometheus two ones are sort of diverging a bit. That's probably just because of um, weird alignment of time when scraping. So we get like select different compression ratios. Um, but yeah. In general, like for high series server environments, we can probably save quite a bit of space in Prometheus 2. Um, in stable environments, this is probably going to be a lot, lot smaller, the delta. Query latency, um, something that we never have measured before. Um, this is, as I said, not super sophisticated, um, but we're just like sort of hitting Prometheus with like really expensive queries and like some cheaper ones. And just measuring uh, here the 95th or 99th percentile latency. Um, and what we can see quite nicely is that Prometheus 1, which is above, um, sort of ramps up over time as we add more series and then stabilizes um, after retention kicks in and the amount of series we delete, are, it's sort of um, in equilibrium with the amount of series we are adding anew. Um, but because it's quite busy already, latencies are quite spiky. Uh, whereas Prometheus 2 stays pretty stable, like there are some spikes in there, which might just be um, like the, the way we time queries. Um, as I said, it's not, not super sophisticated, but in general, like we see the same pattern. Um, we go to a certain st state and level, and we stay there. 
And that's something that we see in all these graphs, basically, right, except for um, storage space, of course. Um, but I think that's the actual benefit of Prometheus uh, too, right? Um, you don't really care about resource consumption. Like if you have a fan in factor of like 10,000, like 10,000 microservices being monitored with like one Prometheus server, you're probably happy to like spend like 50 gigabytes on it. Um, but it must be predictable. <laughs> and if you have to go in and with every scale you do, you have to like uh, tune some knobs and then it runs out of memory again. Um, that's, that's sort of the operational pain you get. Um, so this stable behavior is, I think, the main feature of Prometheus too, hopefully. Um, because also all storage flags are removed. There's just one left, which is a data directory. Um, everything else is sort of just, it is the way it is, right? <laughs> Retention as well, yeah. <laughs> and there are like two flags for like debug purposes and just like to run benchmarks. Um, but in general, you don't have to touch any knobs anymore for the storage. It's sort of self-configuring. It's actually not configuring itself. It just works the way it does. <laughs> So, yeah, um, how does this all work? Um, basically, this development was 10% writing code and 90% staring at graphs. Uh, this is like the profiling output of Go. <laughs> uh, so you can have like memory profiles and uh, locking profiles and um, allocation profiles and CPU profiles. Uh, and basically, as, as you optimize stuff, you just have to like read through those, right? Because it's like we're doing a lot of stuff like hundreds of thousands of samples a second, uh, millions of series, there's just like so much potential to like introduce performance bottlenecks and actually like make changes that actually cause regressions. So that's why this reproducible benchmark was also super helpful because we could just pull these graphs um, from these benchmarks and compare even different versions to each other. Um, then you get like quite nice stuff done, right? Um, because Go is like really, really good at this profiling thing. Uh, and it's also really valuable to be able to profile Prometheus by monitoring Prometheus with Prometheus. Um, because here's one example that's fixed quite recently, um, compactions, right? They are like quite expensive in a way um, because you have to look at data from like huge blocks potentially and write bigger blocks out of it. Um, and this of course cause causes spikes, as you might expect, if you don't sort of optimize all the way. Um, and I personally don't know how I would have even detected those, except for like the application crashing, <laughs> without Prometheus actually monitoring them continuously. And so this was like super helpful. Um, and yeah, and then you can go and optimize away the stuff. And as you can see in the green graph, which is like the latest beta, these spikes are just completely gone. Um, and there's basically a lot of work uh, in this direction. Yeah. Um, of course, not everything is great, right? Like, um, it's, it's, it's fairly new, uh, the whole storage system. Um, and there are just a lot of different things to consider. Um, so, for example, this benchmark was had a relatively small set of active series. Uh, so, let's look at something recent here. Um, that's a Prometheus server that's currently running. Um, and it's collecting data from like 4 million series approximately, from over like, I think like about like 2,000. So of, the, of, of these fake microservices. Um, and you see these like small drops here in actually like how many samples are we getting? Uh, and that's when we are starting a new block <laughs> because we basically have to reinitialize an entire database with over, over 4 million series. Um, and that's quite an expensive operation. We have to rebuild all these indices. Um, that's something I like to optimize away. Um, but in general, it's already a lot more stable than Prometheus 1 would be at this, at this stage. Um, and yeah, you're approximately missing like one scrape per target. Um, and there's like a, a 10 second scrape interval. If you have like 60 seconds, that's probably bad. You know as well. So that's something to improve on, um, but probably nothing that's blocking a 2.0 release, hopefully. Um, and to like just compare memory consumption for like a larger instance here. Um, this is not being queried. Uh, and you can so kind of see the typical TSDB pattern here. So for like 4 million series, we use about between 10 gigabytes of memory and at peak time, um, what like, almost 18. Um, some of these spikes can probably be optimized away, uh, but in general, that's, yeah, that's like 18 gigabytes maximum uh, for like four million series, uh, and it's pretty stable, so that's probably, um, I, I think it's good enough for 2.0. So, um, what else? Backups. <laughs> Um, so you can now do backups, uh, snapshots. Um, takes like two seconds, um, and you now have a snapshot of your entire data and can ship it off somewhere else. 
um, and use it for other processing or just like actually restore uh, Prometheus servers if um, the data got corrupted. And this is sort of two in one picture. Uh, that's Gautam. Uh, that's sort of one of the great side effects of writing this whole thing uh, because we gained uh, a new Prometheus developer. So Gautam's from India. He is here today and we'll give a talk later. Um, Yeah, he implemented some cool stuff um, in Prometheus in general, but especially for TSDB, right? He implemented these backups, um, and he also implemented um, our deletion mechanism, which wasn't around for a long time, um, which should hopefully at some point allow you to like do dynamic retention policies, like keeping some metrics for longer than others. Um, that's sort of like future work. Um, but yeah, TSDB overall um, gives us a lot of potential to like develop all sorts of different stuff in the future, um, and Gautam will talk about it a bit more later. And yeah, try it out. Um, beta one is crashing on startup, so <laughs> <laughs> you gotta fix this uh, and release beta two. <laughs> yeah, and again, if you're interested in working on these kind of things, uh, we are hiring. And if you want to learn more, there's my way too long blog post, um, and the repository is also in the Prometheus organization. Thank you. Who has questions? Okay, first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting talk and your great work. Um, I have a bunch of questions, so maybe you have to interrupt me, I don't know. Um, if you go back to the, is this still on? Yeah, if you go back to the kind of the chunk format and you store deltas of deltas, um, do you at any point have a, a, like a, almost like a keyframe within the chunk that may, means you can avoid traversing the whole chunk if you need to query it? Uh, no, basically chunks are all keyframes. So okay. chunks are especially exactly for the purpose of like jumping into a series at, at certain points. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then my second question was when you did the, you have a graph where you show what the memory use is basically. Yeah. And is that the the go heap size or is that the uh, virtual segment size or resident segment size? So this is the heap size. Um, if you look at the resident uh, memory size, um, that's pretty much the same. Right, just that the, you don't see the spikes as well because Go keeps this memory sort of pending before giving it back to the US, or the US might not even take it back, even if it was told to do so. Mm -hmm. So this just gives us a better idea of when is what happening. Uh, but the actual memory consumption you need is about about the same. Um, if you look at the total usage, this just goes up until you run out of memory. That's the MMAP stuff. So the entire database is MMAPed, and as long as you have free memory, the, the OS will just like keep all this stuff in memory, and we'll just like purge it um, as soon as any, anything else needs more memory. Uh, so this should make Prometheus quite adaptive to actually um, make as much use as it can out of memory, but just also scale it down again. Sounds great. So do you look at what the churn is in the page cache? Is there something that you uh, they use while developing? Uh, no, so there was no extensive testing on actually putting under, under memory pressure, et cetera. Just um, it's probably the next step to do uh, as soon as we actually get reports on this uh, being somewhat of a problem. Um, I mean, we, we kind of seen it, right? Like I've, I've, I've pushed some of these uh, Prometheus servers to the boundary of how much memory the node has and queries were still working. So great. Seems to work, to work okay. And uh, there's one last. It's quick. I don't know if it's maybe too technical. It's about the Go runtime and how it handles MMAP stuff. So maybe if you, it's not specific to this library, but should I ask it now or not? Uh, yeah, go on. Okay, sorry. Uh, so basically, when you MMAP a file, you hit the MMAP, but the file is not in the page cache. Um, Linux will suspend your thread that you're calling it from, puts it in, uh, into interruptible sleep, uh, which basically means that you starve the Go scheduler of a thread. Yeah, I think figure out what happens when it, what it does, whether that works. Um, I was wondering if you've seen anything about that. I, to be honest, I, I looked up for this information like quite a bit. But it's, it's really kind of hard to find anything like specific about it, and it's not totally outdated. Um, I think um, there were like some Go developers mentioned that it there might be problems, but I don't know like how uh, accurate this is from or like recent this information is. Um, I think it just really blocks. Um, 
but we'll have to see like how this turns out, right? If we like run into problems, we can just always uh, swap the MMAP for the like, custom memory pooling. Um, but so far, this seems to work like really well, so I won't touch it until it becomes a problem. <laughs> So, uh, two questions. First, when do you plan to release stable version? <laughs> when it's ready. And the second question is, if we start uh, using it this better now, uh, do you anticipate any data losses or anything like this at this stage? Yeah, so the storage is pretty stable, I think, and um, we had some breaking changes in the storage format um, for the alpha releases, but I think by now we are mostly done, so, and no guarantees, right, but it should be pretty stable. Um, yeah, what's mostly blocking 2.0 is uh, just like other stuff we have to figure out, right, like which API things want, we, do we want to break, like all these discussions, um, and we really want to have version documentation on the website um, before releasing 2.0, just because it's, it's kind of, there's just one documentation which is like the latest release, and that's obviously not gonna work out with major versions. Thank you. <coughs> Hello? Uh, uh, do you build uh, time series uh, labels index uh, for each individual uh, time range, or it's a global index? Uh, no, it's it's local to a block. Like these blocks are really like completely enclosed, isolated databases with no own index, own chunks. So you need, so you have to rebuild that index when new da data is come. Yes, for each block. Yeah, and it's uh, pretty expensive. Um. The index, I think not so much, to be honest. Um, so we, we are using this um, sort of search engine-like inverted index technique, right? Um, but if you look at the research, research around that, like there's an infinite body of like optimizations and crazy algorithms. Um, we don't really need that. We just need the algorithmic sort of uh, complexity of it um, because our, our inverted indices are not that big. Just we don't have to compress them like crazy or something. Um, and they're also not like, that expensive to rebuild. Um, it just doesn't take a lot of time. Just creating new series. It's pretty fast, um, but if you do it like four million times as fast as you can, it's gonna take a few seconds. How many uh, these ranges do you have? Um, so the default is to start off with two hours, which works well for like the typical sample scrap intervals of like 20 to 60 seconds. Basically, it allows you to get like at, the, at least one full chunk to get the ideal compression ratio. Um, and then we always take three of those and compact them into larger blocks. Um, and we do this by default up to 10% of the retention time so that you at most have like a 10% overhead of data as it sort of crosses the retention boundary. Okay. And uh, do you have any plans to support uh, histograms, uh, compression and storing? Yes, yeah, so we have been thinking about that quite a bit partially. Um, there's definitely some really cool stuff to do there, I think. Um, it's just, I think it's a fair bit out, right? First 2.0 is to stabilize. But in the future, I think this could be really cool to, to sort of go into. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, like in uh, last time, as you told, there is a uh, one file per per time series, right? So how this new storage model you are mapping on file systems? Um, so we have one index file, um, which is usually like a few hundred megabytes at most. Usually, it might be just a few few megabytes um, for smaller servers. Um, and then we have multiple chunk files, and we just use 512 megabytes. So we just write chunks into these files sequentially, and if we hit like 512 megabytes, we just start the next one. Um, so yeah, it's it's a couple of files, basically. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if I start uh, using Prometheus now, would you suggest to start right away with 201 or? Depends on the environment, I would say. Um, so I, I talked to someone who wants to sort of work at large scale at the company, but they have like a POC phase for like one month. And yeah, I mean, just go for 2.0 if you don't have any like requirements on like crazy stability. Yeah, okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my question would be more uh, development related. So you shown that profiling tool you were using. Uh, I was going to ask you uh, how difficult was it to use uh, or whether you tried to visualize it differently. Okay, um, it's, it's super easy. Like uh, it's like building Go stuff, right? You don't have to like get anything but the compiler binary. Um, 
And there are like two options, right? You can just like profile the process separately, or you can just use the um, HTTP endpoint in Prometheus, which can just fetch these profiles. Um, it's it's really great. Um, I mean, you can even filter these out, right? And like look, just um, get more details, uh, expansions of uh, certain subsets of the code. Um, the only thing that's really annoying is that the allocations, for example, are from the beginning of the process. So if you profile, you get all the allocations from the beginning of time, and sort of like very frequent and small allocations can sort of shadow big spikes, which is like in this compaction case was really um, tricky to actually figure out what's causing these. Um, and also it just tells you in which function allocations happened, but did not tell you which types actually were allocated. Um, I don't know if it's possible, but it makes it kind of hard. Yeah, so I was basically asking because uh, maybe seeing uh, what exactly uh, makes a difference is uh, somewhat simpler with using frame graphs. And there's a really cool tool, I just looked it up because I'm not a Go developer, uh, that is, that's called GoTorch. So maybe not for you, but for other people developing Go, it might be really useful to get to the really expensive operations. Yeah, I've, I've seen this tool, but I didn't actually try it out. I probably should have. Um, Look pretty cool, so. Okay, thanks. I think there's some stuff coming in Go 9 or so, uh, 1.9, which will allow you to tag allocations or something like that to make this stuff easier as well. Um, impressive work. How do you envision updates from Prometheus 1 to Prometheus 2? Off offline uh, conversion or simply use both storage engines for some time? Yeah, so there are these two options exactly, right? Like on option one is uh, we're going to release Prometheus 1.8 with the remote read enabled and you just point Prometheus 2 to Prometheus 1 to read all the data that it still has around and after retention time sort of passed you just like can kill the old one. That's probably going to work quite well for like two to four weeks of retention time. If you have like one or two years, um, it's probably going to be a bit tougher. Um, like a, a conversion tool can be built. Um, like the new storage is basically just a library, so you can really just use it to do any custom tooling with it. Um, the old storage is not that well suitable for that, so it's not really easy to convert it. You probably just have to read all data like to the normal query interfaces and then just like write it again down somewhere. Um, probably going to be quite a bit slow. Um, but yeah, if someone wants to build that, probably be happy to accept it. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's probably a bit of work. I'm happy to like uh, guide anyone, um, but myself, uh, I think I don't have time to actually write that. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I was looking at the way you are trying to optimize the storage and compress everything and in that time occurred to me that there are some projects for example I have uh, read about uh, RAM Cloud maybe you've heard somebody heard about it it's a project uh, from Stanford University it works on data centers with InfiniBand that you can create a distributed storage uh, in RAM and I was wondering myself why people do not look up also this kind of, um, because you are writing a very specific storage adapter and basically th there is already open source RAM distributed storage that you might be able to use for that and it's fast and it already propagates what you read right in the RAM to disks and it makes it permanent. So if you would probably lose your servers, you you would lose two seconds or or, or less of uh, writings. It's just a thing that yeah. I don't see people interested in this kind of. Uh, sounds interesting, definitely. Uh, I mean, maybe that's sort of a good idea for, to investigate for like a remote or distributed storage system. Uh, Prometheus local storage really like has to be focused on being like self-contained, right, and local and single node deployment. Um, there's certainly like a lot of interesting stuff, um, but we need really need something like self-contained that just like satisfies the performance requirements we have. Um, and yeah, the offerings in open source to solve this problem in, in this sort of performance requirements uh, is quite sparse. Um, thanks to the Prometheus team for all their work on this. Um, we're really excited about using Prometheus 2.0. Um, I have two remarks on the benchmarking. Um, I don't know if you or maybe somebody else um, here might have time to look at this, um, but it'd be interesting to see a comparison between different file systems um, and how they perform. And also, um, with Prometheus being a cross-platform project, um, I'd also be interested if um, anyone's looked at 
um, how M mapping works on different platforms, so Windows or FreeBSD, for example, versus Linux. Uh, yeah, so it works on Windows. Um, I haven't tried it, but <laughs> uh, no, um, the M map uh, exists on Windows. Just like has, it's not just one system call, but like a bundle of them. But uh, it works. I mean, that's. I just basically looked at how other databases are doing this for Go. Um, file systems. Uh, would um, I think it doesn't matter too much in our case here because before we we're dealing with a lot of files and there might be differences in how the file systems handle it. Um, but here we just have a bunch of large files which are like written completely sequentially and just once. Um, so I think a lot of like work that file systems can do for you um, does not necessarily make a difference here. So, but it would be interesting to see for sure. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, lunch starts in about 10 minutes. <laughs>